the International Conference on Open and Flexible Education hosted by the Open University of Hong Kong, one of the keynote speakers was Dr. Alan Bruce. Dr. Bruce is CEO and director of a company called Universal Learning Systems, based in Dublin, but involved in educational projects across the world. Dr. Bruce spoke about the opportunities global citizenship opens up for educational innovation, particularly with regard to new forms of technology and pedagogy and widening access to new communities of learners. I want to flesh out those issues and concerns around what we talk about around innovation within contexts of change and globalization. I fully agree with the introductory remarks that global citizenship, which I want to suggest to you, is a new and stimulating approach to what we talk about in innovative learning, was originally seen as somewhat soft. We were all in favor of this. But globalization has put this in a new context, and that I want to share with you. I'm also acutely aware I do not represent one university. I work with eight different universities on four continents. And a big focus of the work I've been doing over the last number of years is change and change management. And I want to share that with you. So I want to start with a series of questions and points that come to mind when we talk about the issues around globalization and change and innovation. And I want to cover this in five broad chapters. So the five themes I want to share with you and these chapters will shape my work. First of all, talking about educational change and globalized innovation. This is not something which is now remote or down the road, but is living with us. Second, I want to talk about the impact of socioeconomic transformation and how that's resonating in all our countries and all our regions. I want to talk in the third part about new learning needs and digital resources. What do these mean? Are they a panacea? Are they a way out? Or are they a way into something else? And these are questions that I think can inform our discussion. I want to talk very clearly about global citizenship by not so much looking at global, but looking at citizenship. A concept I think is deeply threatened at the moment. Citizenship does entail responsibilities, but also rights. And I think as educators, we should revisit this and revisit it with some urgency. And finally, what are the open horizons we now have? And what are the strategic visions we can suggest to our learners, to ourselves, to our families, and our communities? So let me start first by talking about this educational change and globalized innovation. What do we mean? We have these new globalized realities, and we can see that these are shaped by pervasive change. Change which is now systemic, it's pervasive, it's everywhere. And throughout this pattern of crisis and challenge, we are seeing the impact of growing inequality. My work over these last 30, 40 years has been shaped not just by globalized awareness, but it's been shaped very much by working in marginalized areas and marginalized communities, particularly in the field of disability. But I have witnessed from inside and outside that social space a growing gulf between those who have and those who don't. And I think this is something which has now become a global uh, issue of great proportions. Uh, how does our education therefore respond to this new world? How do we begin to look at how learning can embrace this? In 1994, the OECD produced a report which was called future learning and employment needs. And if we look back 22 years ago, what this report, which is a rather good report, was talking about is that there were five key themes identified that would be coming in the next 10, 20 years. One was policy change, it was really critical. The need for flexibility that we have talked about and what does that mean? Entrepreneurship, which is a little bit like global citizenship sounds wonderful until you say what does it mean? Internationalization, which in those days was recognized, but not as it was to become, and finally technology. These were the five things sketched out 22 years ago, and that future is now. We now 
have things we can state. That universal schooling, the potential provision of this, has been realized. There's no excuse for not having it. Internationalization is not an aspiration. It is the norm for everything we do and everything we learn. The technology is indeed pervasive, much more than people could have envisaged in 1994, and much more than we can envisage even what it will become, but it's unevenly accessible. Flexibility indeed has come in, in different countries interpreted different ways, and I think there are positive and negative sides to this, whether it's a weapon or tool, and the concept of entrepreneurship has been interpreted in diverse and sometimes exotic ways. And finally, policy. Where are we at, having been forewarned, having gone through this, in terms of what we either shape for ourselves or what we copy? So there are a couple of things that emerge from this awareness. First is the need for excellence. An unapologetic sense that we must begin to set targets. We must look at innovation. And innovation not as something we get to, but it constantly informs our practice. Leadership has become a critical element in good quality education. System change, which is purposeful. And finally, reform at all levels. Michael Fullan describes this as the chemistry of widespread improvement. In 2010, the McKinsey Report did a comparative analysis of 20 countries and educational systems. And again, the recommendations from this report six years ago, based on these trends emerging, began to talk about the key needs being around revising curriculum and standards, one which I'm sure will bring joy to many hearts to set appropriate pay for teachers and principals, that you can't have this without resources. And I think this has been proven by facts. Enhancing technical skills for teachers, improving student assessment systems, which um, I think is an ongoing challenge, quality uh, data systems, and finally improving policy and laws. So we have this building up. And we can see when we look at this graph that over these last 20, 25 years, an exponential increase in student demand. From this UNESCO report, we can see various parts of the world, the kind of demands coming up, and you can see particularly in West and East Asia, um, this demand growing and growing dramatically. So within this anticipated and occurring process of change within education, we can see change working its way through. This change is sustained, and it is systemic, and it is accelerating. It's multidimensional. It's at every level, and it's simultaneous. And therefore, we begin to pinpoint more and more those structural incapacities of being able to incorporate the required modifications that we need and adjustments to allow our systems to respond to external and indeed internal pressures. So global education, therefore, is it an aspiration? Is it something which is a threat or a real opportunity? And here are some of the things that I would venture to say we need to begin to look at in terms of how we define our policy goals and aims in shaping strategy. I think we now have not just the potential but the obligation to learn without borders. And the borders physically between countries or indeed regions are not as important as the borders in minds. We must begin to look at the social realities around us, not to sanitize them, but to take on board the real lessons as we go forward. And this issue, therefore, of standards, quality, and assessment doesn't go away. We must move from curriculum to learning competence. And this is a priority as we learn to learn. This adaptability and curiosity to carry us forward. Our learners are already immersed in this world. And very often, our teachers are not as aware as those learners are. And this dichotomy between what learners need and experience and what we're providing is a real threat. So therefore, global is intimately and deeply connected with open. Open borders and open minds, we must understand that open concept because it's critical for the educational policy we decide to shape. Open is always very good when we prescribe it for other people. When we bring it into our own self-discourse, it becomes maybe more challenging because it is deeply contradictory. 
And this openness exists in a world which in some ways is shutting down the barriers against openness. So we are not left with anything other than a choice. We cannot be passive observers. We ourselves must engage. And this brings me to the other great mantra of our time and of the policy reports, which is innovation. Time after time after time, we hear this, it is critical. But what does it mean? And we need to embed this discourse, this innovation supporting learning, supporting work, looking at our traditional systems and bringing it back, linking innovation to creativity, not setting the boundaries of what people can do or what they can question. And this brings me to some of the interesting things. You will see here a comment I have on change without changing. And this is an anecdote from a program I had been involved in. At this stage, 16 years ago, we had developed a distance learning master's program in rehabilitation counseling from the University of Illinois into Ireland. The first time this was done between the United States and Europe. And I was looking for support from our Ministry of Education in Dublin. And we had a meeting with the Secretary General of our Ministry of Education, Department of Education. And I was talking with some degree of passion about this venture, the technology involved, the need being addressed, and the fact it was very innovative. And this wise Mandarin of a civil servant looked at me and said, Alan, I totally support innovation, provided you can show me a precedent. I want you to think about it. And I had been in Ireland long enough to know that if he wanted a precedent, of course it wasn't innovative, but he wanted security and guarantees that I wasn't taking him off to the edge of a cliff and throwing him into the ocean. So we need to look at this, that innovation means really letting go of many things and thinking outside the box. So here's a measure called the Global Innovation Index, which I'd ask you to look at. You can look at some of the criteria on this. this brings in a series of factors, looking at policy formulation, education, social change, inclusion, and countries are ranked on how innovative they are. There are a set of criteria which are worth looking at. Again, for the fifth or sixth year in a row, Switzerland comes number one. The United States has increased its position to five. Finland has gone down to number six. Certainly in Europe, it's held out as probably the most innovative country. Ireland, to my great delight, had come up from 11 to 8. Um, Hong Kong comes in at 11. So it says, and you can go down, you can see Korea at 14, and the People's Republic of China at 29. There are other countries eventually you can get down. This gives us a crude measure if this is what we need to stimulate us. We all like league tables, and what are we going to do with this? But how do we resource this innovation? How do we look at this? And there are a lot of things that come out of this analysis. Talent management, human capital, organizational capital, a lot of rich elements that can be and should be adopted and adapted into our educational systems and economic systems. But a lot of this coming down to the link between advanced education and the economy and policy by three things summed up in the report as listening, linkage, and leading. If we have this innovation, can we bring this into a sustainable educational model? And again, we have the markers for how this innovation becomes real as becoming learner-centered, competence-driven, community-focused, which I think is something we neglect at our peril, a pervasive technological presence, international as the starting point, collaborative, and a focus on curiosity. What is going on? Why is it going on? We have these markers here which I think give us an awful lot of help as we go forward. In this part, I want to look at the impact of that outside world. If we have seen reports, we know what innovation can look like, how it can be defined and how it can be ranked, and we can see some of the indicators. What is happening at the moment to create the stress and strain? So we have issues around globalization, we have issues around the crisis. And I think this is really important because the crisis of 2008, we can now see with hindsight was not a blip. It turns out to be a defining moment in this century's development and we are not going through some magic formula to snap back 
to 2007. We have moved into new and uncharted areas. And this crisis has lent itself in some areas to become a permanent crisis. Certainly in Europe, it has wounded the system deeply and profoundly. Long before the United Kingdom made this decision, we had the implosion in Greece, uh, and indeed in Ireland and Spain and Portugal. We have this question of social justice emerging powerfully, because stratification and inequality have increased, mobile capital can shift in the blink of an eye from one part of the planet to another. We have real issues therefore coming out about how our educational systems respond in terms of access quality and innovation. And if this were not serious enough, we have the generational demographics. So these are the realities we have. Our globalized world is now one of change, of migration, of outsourcing. We have seen so many things beginning to happen and happen at the same time that sometimes it's difficult to assimilate this, and particularly if this is framed within the context of crisis. This new world we live in, this world that our children enter into as the norm, is one where certainty probably no longer exists. If we don't go back to that normal, we see many other things. Mike Davis is a colleague who is professor of geography in UCLA in Los Angeles, and he has written a book called Planet of Slums, where he talks about these hyper cities of the future of 30, 35, 40, and 50 million people. The growth of informal economies as the norm. The difficulty in regulating any of this. And this is before we talk about the connectedness developed through the internet. And these realities are now seen in dramatic ways. In Europe, over the last year, two years, in terms of huge movements of population, the largest since 1945, of migrants, of the chaos uh, resulting from wars and failed states in our surroundings. How do we as educators respond to this? And here we have some of these issues around this crisis since 2008 that I think we must engage with as ed educators. New forms of work, new diversities, these structural imbalances I've already mentioned, all these issues that shape not as something that we can calmly look at in time, but that we need to look at now. This is a very graphic image from the waters between Sicily and Libya, where over this year alone we've had over 10,500 people on boats like this drowning. And this creates a huge, compelling human need. These boat people of the Mediterranean symbolize the crisis that's around us that if we do not look at and do not integrate into our thinking will cause us huge problems in the future. So in this age of uncertainty, how do we learn? How do we shape the learning we pass on to others? One thing I would propose to you is that linear models of learning are no longer valid. We cannot assume that as we go through a lifetime, we reach different stages. You were probably as shaped by this as I was. And that somehow at the end of it, there was a job to keep your mother and father happy. There was some end result. This is no longer there. What is needed, therefore, for today's citizens is not necessarily being provided. And this is our first challenge. In this world of change, where we offer models from a past that is no longer with us, we can watch alienation growing and growing quite profoundly. The labor market to which most of our educational systems ultimately related is now in a state of complete flux. Casualization, temporary work, zero time contracts, a whole set of new jargon and words as well, within which people have to be adaptable and innovative, but for reasons of necessity. And this is going to be very important as we look at the globalized paradigms surrounded by fractured, broken, and demoralized communities. It's a somewhat negative assessment because I think the scale of this has not been fully appreciated. And I think, therefore, let's bring this back to where we are at as educators and where these learning needs at this time of change and crisis come in and match the digital resources that are available.
We've already seen that universal schooling is there and the impact of this is important. We've seen that universities themselves are altering profoundly. They are no longer remote places from the world, but themselves becoming enterprises, becoming competitors, becoming players in a market. We see that legislation and policy more and more shapes where education is, as education needs shape education and policy. And I'm suggesting that the technological revolution has only begun. And this is likely to accelerate as we go on. So let's go back to the OECD report that was produced last year in ICT usage. And this was quite interesting because it reviewed a lot of these. And it talked about, gave various interpretations. It gave some critical analysis of the deployment of digital technologies in schools and in universities. It highlighted the role of PISA results. And we all know PISA has given us, again, another very interesting global framework to compare and contrast. But it also began to talk about the need to develop a richer and deeper understanding of technology and to distinguish this from simple usage or familiarity with computers. And I think the critical thing was this need, recognized in the report, to integrate technology with education and to integrate education with the globalized world. And I hear this may give us something which is really important in addressing the challenges we face. So here we have the summary of this is that the assumption of stable work patterns, of a stable social structure, and linear economic development is simply no longer possible. And therefore, our learning systems will have to respond to this and respond in highly creative and innovative ways. There is simply no alternative. So where do schools stand on this? And again, we worked quite closely with one of the European Union institutes in Seville, and this began to look at its studied creativity in schools in 2011. And I thought this was quite interesting from the point of view of European teachers, that 91% agreed that ICT availability and usage enhanced creativity. This is fine, until we look at the other factors. Only 46% of the same teachers use play. Only 41% used multidisciplinary work. Only 50% believed that that creativity could in any way be assessed. Only 58% training in ICT classroom use. And only 25% claimed that ICT quality in the schools was excellent. Also identified was an institutional resistance to change and a persistence of an ethos of control, discipline, and hierarchy. This to me is frightening. We have a cognitive awareness of a need around creativity, but we have day-by-day -day practice which negates that. We cannot sustain that reality. Open educational resources already exist and these show that we can have widened access. They are cost efficient. And the three impact areas where these are most effective are in lifelong learning, in school education, and in university education. And this is brought out an awful lot. Open Education 2030 was produced by the IPTS. And again, this set a few headline issues based on their research. One interesting thing was that they proposed enhanced communication, communication with the self, the internal dialogue, with the other, and with the wider world. Personalized learning management, demonstrated capability within the context of change, throwing people into situations because this is an urgent and passionate need, moving from teaching to facilitation, many of the things we have already talked about, ubiquity, telepresence, interoperability, these are the things framing what we must do, waves of innovation, and finally the creation of sustainable adult learning networks, some of which can connect to our universities, other of which will be autonomous. This is the vision for 2030. Will we come back here in 14 years and talk whether this has been achieved, or will we simply still be in denial? And I think here we have this.
Charles Ledbetter has talked about this before in some of the formulations that he has brought in, which I think are interesting, talking about schools. A lot of my work is also in school transformation, which I think is interesting, um, where he says it's only possible to assemble solutions personalized to individual need if services work in partnership. We cannot do this alone. And the partnerships themselves must be creative. Ledbetter talks about the issue of motivation talks about the centrality of innovation yet again and instilling purpose in a very pithy formula. I like what he says, education plus technology equals hope, which again may give us some kind of a quick insight into some things we do. Here are some of the drivers of change brought by Ernst and Young in 2012, and you can again see some of the issues. I won't go into this in any detail, it's just to give you some of the flavor. Digital technologies, um, democratization, of knowledge and access, all these things, global mobility. This is coming from Ernst & Young, and not some radical alternative organization. And I think it shows that what we're talking about is supported by evidence and supported by actors from across the social spectrum. These technology trends have also been defined and noted. Internet penetration you'll see here, mobile broadband shows the highest growth rate of any ICT, over 30% per year, and it's growing faster. This last point, it's coming from the Broadband Commission in 2013, mobile broadband is growing faster than any technology in human history. So here we have some of the things, and particularly evident in Africa. And then we have the MOOC, and what the MOOC is gonna go. This again shows a critical shift in distance and e-learning, I would probably take the position that MOOC is early stage of something which would be much more sustained and much more powerful. I think it's a, shall we say, uh, something uh, signaling what's going to come. The impact has been important. I think it's still being worked out. There are many issues, not least around economics, many issues around pedagogical approaches. But it does show more evidence of that shift from structures of the past to broader, universal other forms of engagement with learning and the needs for learning. It does leave a lot of issues unanswered on quality values and standards, but probably deeper issues around ownership and control. How do we support this learning, digital or otherwise? We need to look at motivation and this focus around problem solving, things we've talked about. We need to look at the creation of bonds and links, we need to look at mentoring, we need to go back to people and communities to excavate those models of best practice that really are the incubators of sustainable innovation. I think there's no way out of that conundrum. All right, in the fourth part, I want to therefore suggest to you, it is probably time we began to revisit the concept of citizenship, global citizenship. If we have the benefits and challenges and difficulties of globalization on the one hand, I think it has to be offset on the other by a reassertion of our role no longer as local citizens, but as global citizens. And I feel this is both a threat and an opportunity. One critical path, therefore, is to engage with diverse communities, not with the stereotypes we have of the societies around us. We need to develop massive outreach to new and non-standard sectors. This is where innovation lies. We need to be able to have an immediate reflector that the communities with which we engage, which learn, which develop competence, feed back into our learning loop. We become conscious meddlers in the middle of learning and receiving as well as giving. And this outreach and access should be shaped by legislative foundations, so we're not seen as something which is esoteric and strange, but built right into the core of things, building in new technologies, particularly mobile technologies, we've seen that, and shared learning and linkage, breaking down those barriers between other universities and other educational bodies. What does this mean? Sapi Tawil, in 2013, gave a series of, I think, good connections between education and global citizenship. One, the Taubel said, was to develop a sense of shared destiny 
through identification with social, cultural, and political environments. I will not be constrained by my background or my label or your perception of the label or my perception of yours. In other words, we are linked, all of us. Second thing that Tabu talks about is becoming aware of the challenges posed to community development by understanding the issues related to change. And finally, to engage in civic and social action through participation and transformation based on individual responsibility towards communities. This is what Tawil suggests is a way to link education and global citizenship. Global citizenship, therefore, is more than simply an aspiration or a cliché, but something which goes to the core of our socioeconomic environment, which looks at the scale of social disruption and realizes that this is not a side issue, but now becoming, unfortunately, part of the mainstream discourse, and talks about things like the Global Education First Initiative from 2012. Education must fully assume its central role in helping people to forge more just, peaceful, tolerant, and inclusive societies. The interconnected challenges, therefore, of the 21st century relate directly to 21st century skills and competences. And this new reformulation of citizenship as our operational foundation gives us a sense of rights and obligations in a post-national citizenship framework. I think this is something which bears much more investigation and research. In our learning systems, this global citizenship becomes a pathway into inclusive learning that we have many communities traditionally excluded from education through prejudice, through discrimination, or even geographical remoteness. The tradition of distance education, of open universities, was to reach out to those who had not been involved before, whether they are rural women, whether they are people who have experienced discrimination or prejudice or attack, or whether they are people with disabilities. And therefore, we need to have that sense of vision connected with the innovation of designing for non-standard populations. Intercultural learning strategy should be embedded in this at every level. And this enables us, from language learning right across to skill acquisition, to learn in new ways and to learn new matters that we need. Embedding that learning is going to be important some of the difficulties for me are the problems we have emerging. Certainly in Europe, we can see ample evidence of social dysfunction, of racism, of violence, of despair, but we need to be able that people come back and when they learn and when they find this, they develop a sense of their own empowerment and their own potential. All of us as educators can celebrate and rejoice in that, whatever subject we're teaching. So I'm going to suggest to you that this global citizenship understood properly researched based on evidence as a concept and as a method offers a viable way to liberate education and our associated technologies to discern learning needs in innovative ways. Here are some of the pointers therefore for a future. New knowledge, open distance learning technologies, developing competence, taking traditional teaching as now something which is superseded by mentoring, guiding, facilitating at every level, and developing networks of innovative best practice. And again, we have a few pointers on how we can do this practically. The Skillback Report in 2001 outlined many of these challenges and su suggests what we could do. And in 2012, a wonderful forum was established in Istanbul, a very creative meeting, called the Evolving Corporate Universities Forum. And I found this quite interesting because it included not just universities, independent educators, research bodies, but also companies, progressive companies working already at global level. And looking at corporate universities, looking at the change on all sides, looking at common culture, strategic change, integrating human resource management systems and policies, building partnerships with world-class leading institutions. This is the kind of, I think, indicator of future development which is quite positive. Finally, I want to conclude by talking about if we have open education, 
and open minds, do we have open horizons? Can we begin to imagine the future? Because if we don't, we're not going to get anywhere. This is critically important when we look at where we want to go. We need to start defining this. And the pressure of change, as we saw, is not going to give us any leeway in this. We need to support this. We need to, I think, begin to look at difference in our learners as an advantage. And this is going to call for us to re-examine why we assess the way we assess why we still use examinations that serve only a purpose to rank and exclude. And this does not have necessarily any translation into predictors of best practice subsequently. I quoted earlier Ernst & Young. Ernst & Young created headlines earlier this year. Ernst & Young will no longer look for a degree to give people a job as an accountant. They look for competence. They look for a portfolio. Saying this to people who've spent the last 20 years doing nothing but examinations and memorizing for those examinations and thinking this is the passport for a degree is profoundly difficult and challenging. We need to show evidence that creativity works and what creativity is. We need to break out of the boundaries of national frameworks and think and act globally. I would suggest to you that learning is not a supply chain. It is emancipatory, and people who become emancipated make their own decisions and go in ways they choose. And our task is to join them on that journey, not necessarily to limit it or indeed to follow it blindly. Shaping those futures, therefore, is critical for what we do. So here are some of the things that universities need to do in planning that vision. First of all, recognize there are many other stakeholders in the university other than the academic staff, researchers, teachers, and there are boards of directors, there is the community, there are governments. We need to see that the pressures on the corporate world are very similar to the pressures on universities and vice versa. Universities must to survive in an increasingly competitive world, must be relevant and must be visionary. Otherwise, no exceptions will be made. Universities, as you see now, must be more outward looking, provide leadership, must be efficiency. They cannot be run on purely industrial or corporate norms, but they can set their own standards. And this will be the difference between being active or being passive. We now have the opportunity to anticipate the future. The evidence is there. Excellence therefore is more than simply being up that grading order, being on that league table. It's beyond mechanical measurement. It is about going, engaging with a whole set of new dimensions and realities. This is not my specific skill subject area, no longer an excuse. We must dabble, meddle in everything. We must bring it back and forth. I was profoundly shocked when one student said to me, I showed a piece of evidence, ran a class, and I asked the students what they felt. How did this resonate with their own experience of a world in crisis? And I was met with total silence. I said, please, you've seen something very graphic. I was using video, using music, which is really interesting for finance students. What did you feel? And one young woman looked at me and said, what do you want me to feel? What is the appropriate answer to give you? I can't deal with this. Our young people, we need our students to be able to say this, even if they're wrong. This is how we learn. We need to look at this because the competitiveness that's there can be a threat or can be something that really encourages us to exceed the expectations of others. We must offer that critical space for critical reflection and critical analysis. And that critical reflection is the basis of all innovation throughout our history as a species. So here's some policy opportunities we have. I would suggest we engage briskly and passionately with diverse communities. We develop outreach through MOOCs or whatever technology we have to other sectors. And remember that what they learn, they will need to relearn again or unlearn, as recently departed Alvin Toffler said. Community empowerment, critical. People are not just our passive boxes being filled by what we say. They themselves connect with each other. We must have outreach. We must have new laws that understand this new technology, we must link, we must have these new directions around training of trainers, multilingualism, 
major issue again in Europe, skills, attitudes, buy-in, autonomous learning, risk-taking, research. I'm passionate about research outcomes and doing this at every point and linking that research with practice. And finally, responding to that change. Not being dazzled or intimidated by it, although it is dazzling and intimidating, but also being able to indicate how flexibility can be used. A calm, focused grasp of potential around learning outcomes, around pedagogical design, and constantly reinforced by practice towards a model of transformative learning. We need to foster innovation and creativity, and again, this is going beyond purely econometric targets. So many of our students got jobs, so many of our students with this, so many of our students need to engage with us as we with them. And the three C's that were mentioned were critical reflection, courage, and curiosity. That wonderful combination. So it probably brings us back then to leadership and the quality of leadership going forward. I think we as educators need to design for quality and we need to engage the specialists that form our new emerging university communities. Specialists, researchers, providers, this thinking outside the box looks at other ones. Certainly in Europe, the one we want to look at would be migrants, minorities, and contested spaces. Validity, authenticity, global learning is our stepping stone to excellence. So here's some of the final points. Everything I've tried to share with you today from a macro and strategic perspective shows us something, that we as educators, we working in universities or institutes of higher education, either private or public, are at a crossroads, both in our existing structure and in the process of what we do. We do know that the labor market, such as it is, and education are increasingly connected. They always were, but now they are connected intimately, and it is not possible to decouple. And I think this has a lot of threats as well as opportunities. At a planetary level, we do know that mobility and skills and innovation are the critical paths forward. But we also know that we have increased inequality by a dramatic percentage, over 60% in one generation. And this is increasing. We cannot sustain this global economy with a permanent underclass. Crisis, we know, has now become the norm. So let's deal with it. And here are all the other things we talk about with competence, as we talked about yesterday. Standards, quality, reproducibility, and I would say added value. Sugata Mitra, our colleague from India, talked about this very well. He talked about another three Cs. And recently he talked about the future learning needs. And by the way, in Finland, just to give you a heads up, Finland abolished all subjects in secondary schools in September. They no longer teach specific subjects. They have defined learning outcomes. And I think this is something we need to look at. So Gata Meter talks about, we have three left. One is comprehension. We must teach our students and ourselves how to understand. Second of all, communication. And finally, computation. The rebirth of the beauty of mathematics. Innovative learning, therefore, demands our imagination and our vision. Where is it? So I'll leave you with a couple of images. I like using this, and I've used it before, because when I was 19 years old, I left home. I took myself across the world. And one of the many things I discovered in the Europe in those days was the cathedrals. I became quite fascinated by these cathedrals. There are roughly 250 cathedrals scattered across Europe. They began to be built around the 11th century in their Gothic form, and finally petered out in terms of new construction around the 16th century. Some still continue being built. So over that 500 years, these 250 extraordinary structures were built. Soaring spaces, magnificent stained glass, beautiful woodwork, places, temples of sheer artistic and creative delight. And what's really interesting, from all those cathedrals, ranging from Portugal right up to Germany, all across this continent, we do not have the name of any one single architect. There were no architects. 
These buildings, the stonemasons, the glass workers, the designers, the visionaries, were held together by a common sense of purpose, of belief, of constructive competence. Nowadays, we look at a building, we say it's by IMP, or we say it's by Courboisier. We can talk, we can talk about people. Here we have 500 years of a shared vision in stone and in glass. Without universities, without standards, but with a common passion about excellence and transformation. That is our mission, and that is what I think we can do by embracing global citizenship within frameworks of innovation and new creative practice. She said, thank you. <laughs>